long ago, before the time when the indigenous peoples of this land suffered terrible atrocities. The Navajo twin prophets of old foretold of their eventual return. In 1962, when a small group of Navajos recognized that the Baha'i faith fulfilled their ancient prophecies, a council fire was planned to share this news with their relatives on the Navajo Nation. Baha'u'llah, one of the twin prophets of the Baha'i faith, proclaimed, Verily I say, this is the day in which mankind can behold the face and hear the voice of the promised one. The call of God hath been raised, and the light of his countenance hath been lifted up upon men. It is incumbent upon all the peoples of the world to reconcile their differences, and with perfect unity and peace, abide beneath the shadow of the tree of his care and loving kindness. It's a miracle how the whole thing came together so beautifully. Pine Springs was something that it wasn't, it was, it was basically planned, but actually it was spontaneous combustion. <laughs> we never seen those people before, but they're just coming out of the wood. It was uh, beautiful. Lots of people, different area they came to. The world knows now uh, of, of, of our hearts from all of us, uh, just not, not just um, Dene, um, other tribes, uh, they have beautiful souls. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Chester Khan, um, and I also have a Navajo name. Uh, it is not eight chaya, which means uh, he came. He came with leadership. I am from Pine Springs, which is a, a Navajo community, a small community in Arizona on the Navajo Reservation, Navajo Nation. I was born there, but now I live here in Hauk, Arizona. Um, it is very, very, really, really wonderful to be to be here today and uh, to talk to you about the beauty of the um, meeting that took place over there at Pine Springs back in 1962. Uh, looking back, uh, I think about it quite often because uh, it was one of the most beautiful meetings that I've ever attended. And I became a Baha'i in that year, that spring of in March of 1962, and the meeting took place in 1962, in June, uh, just, uh, I guess, three months after I became a Baha'i. So at that time, my brother and I came into the faith, uh, not knowing each other, had become Baha'i. It was kind of a miracle thing. <laughs> and. Um, so immediately uh, we came together um, there with some other Baha'is that were in this area uh, and told them that we uh, want to um, tell our community at Pine Springs about the Baha'i faith. Yad Ela, where Ah, 
The beginning of it was in Camp Verde, Arizona, where my parents were Baha'i pioneers, home front pioneers. And my sister Norma had met Franklin and Chester in Sparks, Nevada, when both of them were in school. And I think it was about the time that they were married. But um, Norma had gone to Sparks as a home front pioneer after she had heard about the faith. And that's where she learned, that's where she first met pecans. And in, when my folks moved to Camp Verde, Arizona, they had become good friends by then. And Chester and Annie and Franklin and Mary Jane brought their parents and Alfred's parents to the ranch. And they did, the, the elder cons spoke no English at that time. My whole family was so inspired at that time as brand new Baha'is and so enthusiastic, and the con boys were too, that it was translation all day long from Navajo to Navajo to English and back again. And before they left, it was your parents knelt before the, the picture of Abdul Baha and they recognized, they recognized who he was. But that was the beginning, that was the seed for Pine Springs. And then the, the cons and Norma went back to Flagstaff. My name is Mary Jane Kahn. I live in Flagstaff for many years. We used to live in, in uh, Reno, Nevada. That's where we met Norma and Charlotte and heard about the Baha'i faith. And then we moved back here and we live here since then in the 60s. And um, my clan, now Katie Nair, and my dish king Ebashish Chin Sina Jini Dashin Nale and Ashin E Dasha Chi. Then we start talking about the uh, gathering and Point Springs and planning and Narma was so excited about everything they both and, and everybody got all excited about it. Some of you may know uh, Amos Gibson. He and his wife were teaching at Penny Island, Arizona, which is on the reservation here. And they were pioneering, maybe the first pioneers that came to, the, to our reservation at that time. 
in the latter part of the 1950s. Uh, there were some other Baha'is also. Uh, one that I remember is Jim Stone, who lived in Gallup, New Mexico. So we came together and we told them that we, we would like to tell our community about the Baha'i faith. We form a kind of a committee to plan it and to uh, uh, organize it and so forth. And I think it was through uh, Amos, you know, he uh, announced it at his, um, he was on the National Spiritual Assembly at that time. The word began to spread as we were planning. And we set the date for June 1st to begin a three day meeting. We wanted to tell the people, our um, extended family at Pine Springs and the community, people that we know. In those days, um, most of the people that lived there were very traditional people. A lot of them, maybe most of them, didn't uh, speak the language, uh, English language. <laughs> David, my husband, was scheduled to uh, on a speaking tour from, we were living in Los Angeles at the time, and he was scheduled for a speaking tour up the coastline to San Francisco, and every place that we stopped, we told everybody about Pine Springs with great, great enthusiasm, and we ended up with the, the Indian group in San Francisco, and they all came. My little brother Dan was flying at that time, and he had his little two-passenger Cessna, and he was piloting Baha'is from Salt Lake City down to Pine Springs, who wouldn't have been able to come otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> Tester and Franklin decided it would be nice if the Baha'is would have a big meeting out at the chapter house close to where their people lived. Most of their clan was in that area. And so the Baha'is of Gallup traveled out to Pine Springs every weekend. And we cleaned the area, cut the bushes and the shrubs, and got it set up so it would be possible to have campsites for all the people who would come at the time, we had no real understanding of how important the Pine Springs Conference was going to be to the teaching work and to the history of the faith in general. But uh, we knew that it was something that we could do, and we did. There was a lot of prayer. There was a lot of hard work. And, you know, by golly, it was fun. We had people like Jim Stone, the pioneer in Gallup, who taught on the reservation, both the Hopi and the Navajo reservation, and who would drive around the reservation with his truck with a big sign on it saying, all things made new, and repaired washing machines largely. But he was also a repairer and inspirer of souls. There was Walter Jones, who was the resident uh, manager with his wife at the Baha'i Center in Gallup in those days. And Mel Vanderhoof uh, was there for a while. Uh, Gordon Late, the artist. Gordon and his wife, Jean. The programs, we had, um, you know, I believe it was three days that uh, we were together. Uh, we had a, a person that was uh, on our committee who was responsible for organizing, you know, and advanced people to speak. And these individuals uh, gave talks and gave the, um, uh, the introduction of where they come from, what culture they come from and country and so forth and uh, and of course our people local people also we had many elders in those days we had our community leaders uh, a couple of um, 
Navajo Tribal Council from our district in our area uh, were there and some very important people. And in the Baha'i faith, we all know about Zirgula Kadim, who was the hand of the cause at that time. He was there, we invited him to come. And uh, Amos Gibson, who was on the National Spiritual Assembly, who served the following year, he was elected to the Universal House of Justice. That was a very, very important event also, you know. We were very sorry to have him leave us because he was doing so great with us here. And we, miss, we missed him very, very greatly. Chester and Franklin's grandfather, he was there and watched what we were doing. And the last day before the big meeting, when, when it got to be late Sunday and we were getting ready to go, and Franklin said, my grandfather would like to say something to the Baha'is. My grandfather spoke only Navajo, so Franklin translated. <clears throat> and basically what he said was, I have been watching these people these past few weeks and I find the Baha'is to be very good people. And I think you will have a very good meeting. And so for the meeting next weekend, I shall fast and pray this week and I will stop the wind. Now, that may sound like an interesting statement, but you have to realize that the wind was always there. We got up in the morning and drank a cup of sand. <laughs> and it was, in, it was in your food, it was in your mouth. When you got a drink of water, you know, it was the sand, it was always blowing. And so the Friday evening, Franklin read the opening prayer and closed the prayer book. And there wasn't any wind that night. There wasn't any wind on Saturday. On Sunday, no wind. Franklin stood up and read the closing prayer. And as he closed the prayer book, the wind came across the, the clearing and a little spattering of rain. And it was just, it was as though it had been held back and now it wanted to go. And we suddenly realized grandfather had done what he said he would do. In 1962, I came from San Jose, California with my mother, Eva Flack McAllister, and my brother, Louis Gregory McAllister. The three of us came to Pine Springs. We set out a sleeping bags and we camped out and I was about uh, 13 and we just had a wonderful time. I remember the bonfire. I remember chasing kids all around and having a wonderful time lots of love and fellowship. That's what I remember as a child, the love and the fellowship. It was a wonderful spirit and it seems to have brought me back here because I am absolutely in love with and devoted to the Navajo people and especially the children which I teach uh, here in Sanders, Arizona on the Navajo Nation. Alice Bathke has told us the story of Alice Burnside's husband who when he heard about the gathering in Pine Springs, rode his horse all over the Navajo Nation, inviting people, telling them there was a very important meeting in Pine Springs and they really needed to come. And I can just see him on his horse riding across these beautiful juniper trees and the sage, and it's just, you know, about this important message. <laughs> The day came when the, um, for the meeting to begin and the people uh, began to arrive, uh, especially the people from long distances. It was a day ahead of time, I guess, as people started coming from, from all over the um, country, might say. And uh, it turned out to be an international conference or meeting. As an example, um, a whole busload 
of Baha'is and non-Baha'is came all the way from Los Angeles on a great big bus. And there were a group of Taos Indians uh, came also. There were some Plains Indians, uh, some Sioux and the Cherokee and uh, some other tribes came, the Hopis. A representative was sent from all over, from all the way from um, Samoa, yes. He, they sent a representative. I don't know how they got the whole of our, our meeting, <laughs> or knew of our meeting. And this was just absolutely amazing uh, to, to see so many people. There were, some people say it was over a thousand people that came to this Pine Springs gathering. And here, I thought, you know, we thought that it was just going to be local people. But somehow, maybe the spirits took over. Sometimes that happens. Told the people to come. So that, that's um, the way our belief is in Navajo way. The spirits work with us. If we do things the right way for a special purpose, for a divine purpose particularly, Anyway, that's what happened. It was just a miracle how the whole thing came together so beautifully. My name is Emmanuel Ankara, and originally from Ghana, West Africa. In 1962, Amos Gibson instructed me to go and joined Dr. Street from Indiana to en route to Navajo Res Reservation for a conference. Before the conference started, there were several cars of police cars with their lineup, with their rifles and everything, truncheons and everything. After the first section in the morning, I walked to them and find out the reason why they were there. That they should be there because there will be a route so that they can uh, control the route. And there I instructed them that whenever they were any place that the Baha'is are gathering, there will never be a rout. But before that time, there was a pamphlet was distributed a week before we get there that the Baha'is are not good, they cause problems, and all those things. After the first section was over, the police left before two, three o'clock, two, two or three o'clock, they left and they never returned until the conference adjourned. I love the, the American Indians. I love them so much because of, of their culture. It, it rhymes with my culture back home. I gained so many friendships from them when I was there. I was, uh, sending them uh, the African uh, message how much the Africans love the Indians. Yeah. At first we saw everyone except our Native Americans who were Baha'is coming from everywhere, but it was, it was as all, all the Indian folks were watching to see what was happening and when they came, they seemed to come all at once. <laughs> they did. But the thing that amazed us so much is they were making the big pots of stew and getting everything ready. And there were there were a, a horse or two, and there was you know there were animals around, and everybody was busy. There was dust, but there weren't any flies. There weren't any flies. I mean, it just seemed that the spirit was so high that they couldn't. They couldn't function. <laughs> Alfred Lee Khan Sr. 
Shantin Rana Hai Ahe Shehelan. My mom was here, my dad was here, Alta Khan, Jack Khan, yeah. my aunt was here, Mabel Myers, all of my extended relatives, Baha'is, many people here dance all night but around a big fire, bonfire. Like we do when we go out to um, Nda, uh, healing ceremony. We, we sing, we dance all night the same way. It's so amazing um, that with people with campfires out here, I, I still see the campfires uh, under these trees, visiting each one, each family. They're sharing their different food and, and, and so loving and so had such great love, great, great. I never felt so, so loved in that in those few nights and days. We could hear the drums, we could hear the beat, we could hear the dancing, and went to sleep with that in our ears, which was so wonderful. And the next morning, we were told that the reason that they were dancing for such a prolonged period is that the spirit was so high that they were putting grounding it into the ground so that it would be a holy spot for generations to come. The next day, grandfather, they called him grandfather, and he became a Baha'i. My wife and I are both artistic, and uh, we did a number of things, like we had a tent we prepared with uh, Indian symbols and different symbols of religion, and we also did a sort of a totem in front of the uh, tent, which we planted in, uh, at Pine Springs. Uh, we also made a flag, a Baha'i flag. Uh, to my knowledge, it's the first Baha'i flag to fly in North or South America. And so we made it blue with white letters of the greatest name on it and uh, put it up there. And it turned out to be very important later on. We had made the flag, but we hadn't really discussed it with anybody. So I, I, I went to Amos and I asked him, I said, can we put the flag up? I went to Franklin Khan and Franklin Khan said, sure, it stuck it in the ground. And so it stayed there and it stayed up the whole time. They had like fire campfires all over the place and little groups of firesides going on all night long. Uh, the the thing is that um, uh, later I heard something, Amos told me something that I never, I didn't know at the time, but uh, he, uh, we, we were talking about it and he said, well, you know why that happened? And I said, no. He said, it's your flag. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, there was uh, there was some Indian who before the conference heard about it and saw had a dream in which he saw this flag, a blue flag, <laughs> with strange symbols on it. And all he knew was it was good, good luck. It was a good symbol. And so when he came in and saw our flag, he went back and told all the other Indians about this thing which he'd seen in the dream. And they started coming in. That's what happened, and all night long we had this, and there were a number of declarations overnight at these firesides. And uh, it was a, a, a momentous thing because uh, it opened uh, the way to the reservation. Many, many things happened, like the local community organized the whole thing. They even exhibited the local arts in the building, like the rugs and the arts of our Navajo country. The people, some of them, the families, and start planning to help with the different things. And they did. There's a lot of family there. Just like the ceremony, they usually put it on. They just come around on that day, the day that was the meeting, and they start doing all the cooking and helping with the cookings. The local women also organized the dinner. It was the first day. 
where they bake a cake uh, throughout the night. That this great big cake that's that we have that when we have a special ceremony, the beauty way ceremony. It's usually the way it's done is uh, they, they dig a hole outside, maybe four uh, four feet in diameter, and they mix the uh, corn mush and cornmeal and some other ingredients and pour it in there. Before they pour it in, they build a fire to warm the ground. And then they put the, uh, with corn husks around it and and then on top of it, they, they cover it with the um, hot ash and they build a fire on it. And that fire goes on all night until the morning is ready to be cut and, and used, you know. That, that's what they did. That, so that was really amazing just to see that, what, what the people did, you know, themselves locally. And they also butchered uh, some sheep that was her main dish, so to, so to speak, and fry bread and tortillas and some other uh, foods that they prepared for over a thousand people. It was uh, beautiful. Lots of people, different area they came to. I'm trying to imagine in my head how it's going to come out, but it sure did. It came out real good. Very good. And the local people were so impressed with this, this gathering, this meeting. Uh, they were so impressed with the Baha'i faith, what, what the Baha'i faith means, what it represents, and what the purpose of the Baha'i faith is. Uh, people co come in to talk, people who spoke about the Baha'is that spoke about, like Mr. Kadim, Mr. Gibson, and ourselves, those of us who had become Baha'is. At that time, I would say that we were, there were maybe just half a dozen Navajo Baha'is. And uh, uh, the people were so, um, so impressed with it, and they kept saying, this is something that's really, really beautiful. We need it. This is what we need uh, in our in our Navajo Nation. Um, so it was really wonderful to l listen to these, um, especially the elders, who um, heard about it. And frankly, my brother was the the MC. We took turn. I would translate most of the uh, uh, English way of speaking. And then the Navajo spoke, uh, spoke, and I would translate that into English. Back and forth for three days, it's quite a job. <laughs> Hi, I'm Georgia Sanchez, and uh, originally from Texas, and I found the Baha'i Faith in Los Angeles. Actually, uh, Eulalia Bobo, one of you probably know of Eulalia, she was a great teacher, and uh, Tallulah Pettigrew. Those were my first spiritual mothers that I heard about the Baha'i Faith in 1962. Around the time, actually, of the Navajo Indian Reservation, Pine Springs, wonderful, wonderful conference. Uh, it was exciting, and they said, Georgia, you've got to go. Keith and Bob Quigley, everybody, our little Beverly Hills group went. And I understand there was over a hundred people just from California. But the one thing that caught me, and I remember, the Native American or the Indian women had made some type of, I don't know if it was cake or bread. Uh, they do the same thing in Africa. I've pioneered to Africa. And I noticed the Native Americans and the Africans are so much alike. They made a bread and they put it in coin husk and they had um, hot stones and, and, and they would put this under these stones and they cooked this bread, and that's what we had as a treat. It was sweet, I remember that. And I was touched just being there around so many ethnicities and people from other countries. It was amazing. Now, Hand of the Cause Kadim opened this conference for that afternoon session. He chanted 
Oh, it was unbelievable, melodious. And after that, many people prayed and spoke. Mr. Kadim being a gentle man, gentle but strong, he wasn't a pushover. He was always there, and his wife as well. They were so loving and kind, and no matter what type of questions the non Baha'is would ask, sometimes very rough questions about how do you expect us to believe that you're going to change mankind. Gently quoting from Baha'u'llah and, and referring them to certain aspects of the faith. And this touched your heart. They had what they called the fire dances, they had sacred dances, and many short talks from other people that same night. There were several declarations. People who were not Baha'is actually became Baha'is from that conference. The people really understood uh, what the Baha'i faith was all about. And uh, it was just uh, so, so beautiful to see the whole process. That was probably one of the most beautiful spiritual meetings I have ever attended to. And of course, the Navajos also talk about their, from their traditional ways of life and to share to the people through our history of what took place uh, here with the United States, uh, like the one that, what we call the long walk. Uh, the Navajos were driven from, their, from our holy land right here to a place called Bas Redondo, which is far away from here. And the Navajos were treated very, very badly uh, as other nations, other Native Americans have experienced, uh, like the Cherokees and uh, the Western uh, nations. Of course, today, even today, people don't know much about it, uh, what, what took place in 1863, 1864, 65, 66 to 68. The military came here at that time uh, and built uh, Fort Defiance and Fort Wingate on our reservation without permission. They just came and took over, so to speak. In 1863, a new general came uh, who was the worst uh, hateful individual who hated the, uh, the Native Americans and said, we'll drive the Navajos out of here, out of their land into a reservation at Fort, uh, Fort Sumner. And the Navajos just couldn't believe it. Why, why are they doing this to us? We didn't do anything to these Pelicanas. Well, the kind of meeting, meeting the white people. They just couldn't believe uh, that they were going to be driven. So when they heard that, they, of course, the, uh, the war, the United States declared war on the Navajos to bring all the Navajos together so they could be driven from this land. The Navajos just moved away because they were killing the people on site, uh, if you were not here, uh, the general said by July 20th in 1864, you have to be here by that time so you can be driven. You will, you will be taken to Fort Sumner, Boss Redondo. But say, why do we need to go there? We, do, we, we, we live here. So nobody came. When that date came, and that's when they, the government declared war on the Navajos, and the Navajos went away. They just moved away from their homes. They left their homes into far distance to the north and west, like Grand Canyon and into Utah. They had just left their homes and took whatever they could carry on their backs or on their horses. And within two months, they ran out of food. Some of them had taken their sheep. 
and sometimes they were caught by the soldiers and they were taken their sheep were taken and they were killed or captured and in the middle of the winter that went that winter uh, people began to starve because they didn't have any food and the snow was so deep and it was so cold no homes nothing they didn't have enough blankets to keep them warm so the only thing they could do was surrender and that spring uh, in 1864, there were several different groups, a thousand, two thousands were driven. On the way to Foster Dondo, because they were driven in a forced march, anybody who was sick or elderly, they could, anybody who could not keep up, they were just shot or just left behind. Coyotes would just eat them. Uh, that was the process of going up there from here to Fort, Fort Sumner. And uh, the, the people just could not, uh, did not know what to do with the whole process. And when they got there, there's nothing there, and they suffered for four more years just being held there for what? Nothing. The soldiers were there guarding them all the time. So that's, that's the only reservation that was called prisoner, a prisoner, Navajo prisoner. The whole tribe was in prison for four years. Many of them died of starvation and uh, the people really, really suffered because they didn't have any food. They tried to plant every year, but nothing grew. Absolutely nothing was there. There was no, no timber to build homes. No, so they had to dig holes in the ground to live in there and cover it with whatever, whatever they could find in the area. They had to go 10, 20 miles to get wood to build a fire for fuel and cooking and so forth. So there were all kinds of things going on very, very terribly and very, the experience was what I call atrocity during that four year period. And it's really hard to talk about it because people really suffered. Many people also uh, died from diseases that they had never seen before, they had never experienced before. Uh, a very, very, this was a very, very, very bad time that my great uh, grandmother and grandfathers went through. Uh, just to let you know, if you don't know our history, that's what we went, our ancestors went through. So that was the beginning when they came back here. General Sherman was the one that was responsible. He was sent from Washington, D.C. to investigate what was going on. He was thinking of sending the Navajos to Indian Territory in Oklahoma. But the Navajo leaders persuaded him to let the Navajos return to their homeland over here. When they returned, it was a new life, so to speak, because they had to go by the treaty which the U.S. government had designed for them. And they gave, them, gave us a small reservation, what they call a reservation. And we, you can't do this, you can't do this, this, is the only thing we can do, and so forth. The laws uh, that was given to us to live by. One of the law was that we will send our children to uh, school. And then I was at a hard time getting used to this, this new way of life. But uh, finally they, they got used to it, and they started sending their children to school. Uh, one of the uh, very important thing about the um, Navajo history back in 1850s and 1860s and being a Baha'i and what it took place also looking at the Baha'i Baha side, Baha'i uh, revelation, what was going on at that same time. We know that uh, Baha'u'llah, the glory of God, 
the prophet that was sent by God who um, uh, who began this revelation, a new revelation for God. Baha'u'llah means uh, glory of God. And um, in other words, um, the great spirit, the great God had appointed him to be the the manifestation for this new day and age. However, in Persia, uh, where he lived, another manifestation of God that came before him, his name was the Bab, which is translated, which means the gate. He came first um, to that part of the country, also sent by God, and his mission was to to be the herald, the uh, to be the the spokesperson ahead of Baha'u'llah, to to talk about Baha'u'llah's coming to the people in those days. The clergies wanted this movement to stop, and they were trying to extinguish it. They decided that the only way to get rid of this revelation, this new new faith, was to kill the the messenger himself, the Bob. So they executed him in a public square where in front of thousands of people. Baha'u'llah was uh, arrested and was taken to uh, a dungeon in a prison, a place called Black Pit. And for many months he was there and suffered a great deal. They put a great big chain around his neck same time, the other believers who um, accepted Bob were being persecuted. Many of them were being martyred, being killed. Uh, but thousands and thousands of the people, just for in a short time, really said, this is the truth. This is the true message from God. It's in our prophecy that this would come. And of course, uh, the government there and the clergy just opposed the whole process. And Baha'u'llah was um, released from jail, from the jail, and and the government exiled him out of that country into Baghdad, uh, Iraq. He was taken with his family, his uh, wife and and uh, some close family members. So they were exiled in the middle of the winter in 1853. Over the mountains in the winter time, they had to walk many, many miles and miles to that to that place. And he spent uh, ten years in Baghdad as a prisoner. And uh, he was he was treated very, very badly. He suffered a great deal, but. He said he has done nothing wrong to anybody or to any government. But he says this message that that, that, that I that I belong to now. What what the Bob has brought is the truth. I cannot change that. There's no way I can change it. And uh, and during that period of time, he just disappeared one day, and he went to the mountains. My thinking is that perhaps he went there to, to prepare himself to be stronger. He was exiled again with his family. And where he stayed in another area, I think five years, the same thing happened. They set him on and they said, we'll, we'll put him in prison in Alka, what is now Israel. And this was the most great prison, the worst criminals were sent there. Uh, now as we would call it Awal uh, Yasa'ah, the most great prison. He was sent there and so the point is that I'm trying to make is he was he suffered a great deal. And here when I look at when we look at the Navajo, uh, what was going on here at the same, that same period of time, there, here in 1850s, 1860s, the government of the United States sent their troops 
Bill fortified, I believe it was in 1851, and tried to con conquer the Navajo people. The Navajos were very peaceful people. So when I look at the what took place with Baha'u'llah and the Baha'is at that time, it's the same thing. What they experienced, we experienced we experience that same process of suffering, atrocities. For what? One side was a spiritual people, one side was not. That's the only difference. That's why it happened. My name is Alfred Kahn, Jr. I was uh, raised on the Navajo Reservation, and uh, my clans are uh, Bitani, uh, Sanjikini, and I, uh, that's what I'm born for. And I am uh, people of the Middle Water, Osage. Uh, my mother is um, Osage and Hungarian. And I'm happy to share with you and to um, my little knowledge. Um, my uncles are Franklin and Chester, and I, I spend a lot of time with them, learning from them. So in the, in the Navajo teachings, there's a story of the, our creation. And uh, through that story, we learn about um, who we are and what, how we came into this world. And there's uh, four worlds, and we're in the fifth world. And when we uh, share, learn about this story, uh, we start to hear about uh, a time when the Navajo people were uh, living relatively peacefully until um, a great uh, plague, you know, of uh, came to them and it disrupted everything they had um, believed, you know, they had uh, based uh, their f culture and society on. Everything was in upheaval, and all these teachings um, that they had, they had forgotten them, and so all these um, big giants and big monsters came and they uh, started to attack the Navajo people. And so when the uh, Navajo people uh, prayed for help, there was born among the Navajo people um, twins. Uh, but they weren't, f uh, the twins' father was the sun and the twins' mother was the earth. So they were born into the Navajo people, but they're, they were really from uh, father, son, and mother earth. And um, as these twins grew up, they looked around themselves, and they themselves were youth. They saw the um, plight of their people. And so they went on a, a journey and a quest to find the weapons to, um, or find the tools to stop this plague and stop this uh, destruction. And so they went uh, on a journey to the sun, uh, and they went on a rainbow. And on that rainbow, they uh, went on through many trials to prove their worth and to find who they were. And so after many trials, they finally arrived to the sun. And uh, the sun, uh, you know, spoke to them and said, you know, you're my, you're my sons and um, I'll give you this gift and you can go and help, help the Navajo people. And so they gave, him, gave them a bow and arrow and they came back to the Navajo people and uh, with this bow and arrow, they uh, destroyed all the monsters that had been plaguing the Navajo people. And when the twins, you know, had finished um, destroying all the monsters, they turned to the Navajo people, you know, before they were about to leave, and they said, "We're, we're going to return. There's going to be a time when um, you're going to, you're going to need our help again. You know, um, you're going to have turned away from these teachings and." You're, you're going to have be plagued um, by these mon by monsters again, you know, and these monsters are going to come back, and uh, the Navajo people are going to be on the brink of destruction. So uh, you need to look for us again. Look for these uh, for for us to come from the east, and uh, when we come back, we'll bring the new tools that you need, to, and we will help you. So just look for us. When you look at these teachings, uh, when you find uh, Bob and Baha'u'llah, who are the twin manifestations, they come to us from the East. Um, they are the continuation of the Navajo culture. You know, this is the, the ones we've been waiting for. They give us the uh, Baha'i teachings and they are, show us exactly how to uh, defeat all these ills that are plaguing us. 
you know, uh, they give us the same tools that we were given uh, the, at the time when the first twins came to help uh, the Navajo people. But they're new tools, you know, they're different problems we have, different challenges. So when we um, use these teachings, you know, we're using the tools that uh, the ancient holy ones uh, intended for us to have at this time. Hey, 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 hey.